I grew up in a, in a household that always had music on. My, my mother and father were, were avid music lovers. My earliest musical memories are listening to the Beatles in the car. I don't think there was a time that we didn't have music on some, in somewhere, either in the house or in the car. So I grew up around music. My sister grew up taking classical piano lessons. I didn't have any formal training, but uh, we had the piano in the house, so I, I started like plinking around and just learning how to play on my own. I started playing in bands in high school and uh, picked up the bass guitar. That was my primary instrument. I played keyboards a little bit in the band, but then mostly it was bass guitar. That's what I gravitated to. But my first passion really was recording. I, I discovered this old Webcore reel-to-reel -reel tape machine. I think I was about seven in the attic, and I pulled it out and like put, you know, without telling anybody, I was like, you know, and then <laughs> started playing around with it. And then I would record my sister playing piano and was really into just like hearing how things sounded differently when I moved the microphone around the room. And it was just one microphone, but uh, just really being into that and, and then making like, we used to call them pause tapes, but like, you know, you record stuff on the radio and you basically like record and then pause it and then do something else and make your own mixtapes. I was always fascinated by the audio, I guess the technical side of audio. That was a, really a passion of mine, even from when I was a little kid. The Beatles records were a big thing for me because I would listen to the old Beatles records, if you know it, where it's like one side of the, like the left ear would just be drums sometimes and music, and then the right ear would just be vocals only and maybe a couple other things. I had this old stereo where I had a, it basically had a pan knob, a left-right thing. So I could, I would put it to the left and just listen to just the drums, where I put it to the right and just listen to the vocals. And sometimes you can hear talking in between the vocal takes and it was like, the whole thing fascinated me. So later on, when I was in bands and stuff like that, I, I got my first four track when I was uh, about 14. And then I got into bands maybe about a year or two after that. And I, uh, I always was into like, okay, hey, I got this thing. Let's, we, can, we can record stuff. We can record us, our band rehearsal and thinking we were gonna make this masterpiece on this little cassette four track, you know? Because like, oh, you know, Sgt. Pepper was done on a four track, so why can't I do that? You know, not knowing that there was a lot of other equipment involved. I was always into like making these demos sound as cool as possible. And then when we recorded our debut album at Track C's at the studio, I actually cut my teeth on. I was like the first one there, the last one to leave. I was always super into it. I was probably annoying the hell out of the guy who produced the record. But then I wound up working at that studio, long story short. So I was always into the, the studio side of things. I mean, I love playing in bands, I love playing music, but my whole thing always was, with my, old, my original band, I was like, oh, I hope the band makes it so I can, I can eventually build a recording studio. So the end goal was always to be in the studio, because that's my, you know, I love playing live, but I love being in the studio, I love creating. That's always been my, my go-to. One of the records that really was a breakthrough record for me was, it wasn't even a well-known band, but it, was, it got to be well-known amongst other bands, was the band called Dead Guy, the album called Fixation on a Coworker. That actually, that record was my introduction to the label Victory Records, which was this hardcore label, and I wound up doing like 15 or so late records for that label. So after I did get Dead Guy and then also Snapcase Progression Through Unlearning was a, was a big one that pushed my career forward. As far as the metal side of things, also the first Dillinger Escape Plan, Calculating Infinity was a big one for me. And then on the emo pop punk or punk side of things, Lifetime Jersey's Best Dancers was a big one. Uh, the first Kid Dynamite record, Saves the Day Through Being Cool. I think all those like early on in my career was, were the things that really started bringing me a lot of other work and a lot of other bands. My most memorable moment in the studio, I'd have to say more than anything, was you know, I engineered a Cure record in London. And yeah, I spent six months in London. So as a whole, that six months I spent in London at working at Olympic Studios was one of the most legendary studios of all time. Uh, and working with one of my favorite bands, that was probably my overall, my most favorite moment. I have plenty of them, but that was really something, something else. And to watch, you know, record Robert and watch him sing vocals and just, you know, it was pretty awesome. Yeah. 
What advice would I give my younger self? I've been doing this a long time, and I think early on I was really more about like everything has to be perfect and everything has to be, has to go the exact way. And I think the older I get, the more I realize that sometimes the best producing you can do or the best engineering you can do is to step back, get out of the way, and let it happen how it's naturally gonna happen. Because uh, I was so wound up with making sure everything happened perfectly and this is, this is right, but you know, life isn't perfect and things don't always go the way you want them to and you have to learn how to adapt and roll with the punches, which I'm, I'm way more adept at now, but you know, and, and observing a lot of, I became friends with a lot of producers um, and work with a, a few really, you know, work with a bunch of really great producers and a bunch of really great engineers and all the great ones, they learn to roll with the punches and they don't get flustered when something goes horribly wrong, which in the studio can often happen. When I'm looking for a guitar tone is I'm looking for something that's gonna match the player. There's never a one size fits all for anything. Obviously, in, in a certain genre of music, in a heavy music, there's a certain amount of distortion or a certain amount of like crunch or a certain amount that you're looking for. But the idea is to never, never put yourself in a box and like really just have something that's adaptable to every player. So the most important thing for me is listening. And I don't mean just necessarily what's coming out of the speakers. I mean, there's a big difference between hearing and listening. And it's more about being aware and adapting things to the current situation. And so as far as guitar, dialing in a, a tone that's gonna work with the player, you have to adapt and you have to adjust to the individual. I mean, I'm always learning, I'm always trying, and I'm always experimenting with new things. In the studio, I try to always try something new. I'll just try a different mic on this cabinet because just because I've never used it. Like, what is this gonna sound like? And then as far as like just as an overall, you know, just try and take in as much culture and as much and listen to different genres of music because it's all gonna influence you into what you do. Even though, you know, I work primarily in rock and punk and metal, like I'll listen to other stuff and you know, I'll go to New York with my wife and go to go to Broadway shows and go to see musicals and like, you know, stuff like that. Like just you, you know, taking in outside cultural influences is is huge because if you just stay on the same track. It's just, you're gonna wind up being stale and then you wind up repeating the same things and it becomes a little robotic. What people can expect from this expansion pack is these tones are pretty malleable. They're, they're, they can be shaped in a lot of different ways because they're not overly bright they're actually meant to be EQ. They're meant to take EQ really well. So when you listen to them, when you pull them up, they might be on the darker side of things, but all you gotta do is give it a little top end EQ and it's gonna sound awesome. I know that there's a tendency to make things more finished, but that wasn't the idea. The idea was coming from a purely engineering standpoint where these tones, they're not so much boxed in where they're overly bright or overly boomy. They're really kind of like just good solid tones that you can then shape with EQ to match the player a little better or to match the mood of the song. One of the amps that I have in here, which is a very, very unique one, is this Vox Cambridge 1964 combo. That's a really cool, it's got like, it's more clean stuff, but it's also like kind of like overdriven rock. It's a very rare and a very unique amp, and it's uh, I've used it over my career on a bunch of different things. It's it's we were actually uh, apart for a long time, and then when my old studio closed, uh, the owner sold it to me, and uh, I'm glad to have it back in my possession because I used it on a lot of records, and I use it in this pack. I know other people have 5150s in their in their pack, and or 6505s or 6505 pluses, but this is the 5150 combo which is a different beast unto itself because it's half the wattage. It's only 60 watts and it has a reverb tank, which is totally unique to the combo amps. We didn't run the cabinet. We ran it through an orange Vinci's 30 cabinet and then also my Marshall 412 as well. But 
but this head is, it's got its own, own distinct sound to it. If I had to pick one, it would be the, uh, the Bogner Ecstasy that I have back here because it's such a versatile amp. It's got a great clean tone. It's got a great like mid kind of rock, like Marshall-y kind of tone. It can go super heavy like the, like the Ubershaw, but it's, uh, it's just very, very versatile. And it's got, you know, different switches. You can run it half power, you can run it full power. It adapts to a lot of different styles. And like, I, I really love that about it. What I think people are really gonna love about this pack is that when they really get into it and they really start to play around with it, and again, it's very important, these tones are designed to take EQ exceptionally well. So the idea is get in there, throw an EQ on it, tweak it, and you're gonna come up with something that you're really happy with. These tones are, are very, very pliable. They're meant to be shaped and molded to suit exactly what you need. <laughs>